Okay, so we're, we're going to start a new uh, topic now, and we're going to focus on nonlinear finite elements. And, and right now, we're gonna, just going to focus on 1D, um, because I think it's uh, easiest to see some of the issues in play in 1D before we try to complicate it with 3D. But actually, this lecture is, is a motivation for why we need to talk about nonlinear finite elements. So it's actually, gonna, I'm going to use some 3D examples so that it's um, easier to see why we might need those. Okay, so let's let's just say let's let's begin by uh, considering three different loading scenarios okay so the first loading scenario that we're going to consider is we're going to consider a sphere a hard sphere indenting a plate okay so let's let's talk about what the initial um, configuration looks like okay so this is before deformation has occurred so let's say that, uh, let's just choose this to be our plate, right? And we'll draw our sphere. It's going to Im impact or contact right there. So that's supposed to be a sphere, okay? And we're going to apply some load to the sphere. And let's go ahead and set the boundary conditions such that this is fixed on the bottom. It doesn't really matter for this application, okay? So that's the initial configuration. Now, after some deformation, I'll call it the final configuration, but it doesn't need to be the final. It's just some time after the initial. So what does that look like? Let me draw my plate. Okay, but now uh, the sphere has, has indented Let's, let's say that it has come to this location, something like that, okay? So, so what has happened now is that, let me, let me highlight, okay? Let me highlight what has happened. So in, in this first initial configuration, we had, we had a contact point that was a single, that was a single point right underneath the, the uh, sphere. Now, the sphere is in contact with all of these points along the whole edge here, right? So if you like that. Okay, so that's our new contact point. Um, so, so what happened? Well, what happened was that if, if we're trying to build the FEA model for this, and we're trying to do it in the way that we've done before, um, we would go in and we would apply our, we would look at this surface, right? And we would say, well, uh, Every node on this free surface it, uh, has a, a zero stress um, on it, right? That's how we would uh, define that. We don't know the displacement, but it has a zero stress. But over here, a bunch of those nodes that we had initially said had a zero stress state, now they have moved to being displacement controlled and don't have a zero stress state, okay? So what, what happened here? So let me, let me just uh, note that parts of... Uh, our our force vector, F, right? Those are our nodal forces. They change abruptly uh, from a free surface, with, which is defining the traction, to a displacement controlled surface. Okay, and so so in one case we know the force, we don't know the displacement, and then all of a sudden we switch to knowing the displacement, and having to compute the force, right? So. So what that gives us is, is what we call a boundary condition nonlinearity. And in this case, it's due to contact. So in general, contact creates boundary condition nonlinearities, right? So what does that mean? It, we, it means that we have something that looks like our force vector F is really F, but it depends on U, the displacement, right? It depends on you via the boundary conditions, okay? So um, this is not, uh, normally they're proportional, right? Normally we just take K, our stiffness matrix, multiply it by U to get F. Um, but in this case, their F itself is changing and that relationship between U and, and uh, F uh, changes as well because certain boundary conditions are active and in, in one state of the load and then not active at the other state of the load and vice versa. Okay. Now let's take a second example. Okay. Our second scenario is going to be a, a fishing rod that's loaded. Okay. 
right? So, so we catch a big fish. Uh, we're going to pretend that we're a cantilever. And this is the initial state. So let me write this as the initial. And we're going to put some load of our enormous fish on there. Call that load P, right? Now, what about the final configuration? So in the final configuration, I'm going to draw what we had originally. This is the the rod before deformation. And I'm going to exaggerate this for effect, but this is the rod, let's say, after deformation. Still being applied with a load of P. Okay? So, what do I want to say here? I will say that you would never expect this sort of a configuration in the initial, let me underline the initial, right? This, this sort of configuration to generate the same type of stresses throughout the rod as this type of configuration where the rod is now beginning to align with the load, okay? So what, what does that mean there? It means that, uh, so let's, it means that the, the orientation, right? What's changing is how the elements are oriented relative to the load. So the orientation of the elements uh, with respect to the load uh, changes during loading. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if I were constructing the stiffness matrix for this straight rod, it's going to look different than the stiffness matrix for this a highly flexed rod, right? So what that means is that K, my stiffness matrix, uh, is going to depend on U, right? So we could write then that K uh, is equal to some function of U, which is not what we had in the linear elastic case that we have been developing, okay? And we, we typically call this form, we call this a geometric nonlinearity. Okay. This is just an example, right? There are other types of geometric nonlinearity you could think about um, if you had uh, uh, um, necking, let's say, in a, in, a, in a tensile specimen, and the cross-sectional area is getting smaller, you want to account for the fact that that's, that cross-sectional area is changing during the loading. The reason I didn't choose that uh, is because there's two nonlinear forms that are uh, impacting that particular problem. This was this... In this case, the fishing rod can be purely elastic, but it's a nonlinear problem because of uh, uh, the geometry changing significantly during the loading. Okay, so this is called a geometric nonlinearity. Now let's talk about a third scenario, and it's sort of what I brought up. How about yielding uh, of an aluminum tensile specimen? Okay, so let me draw my my sample here, there's my tensile sample, some gauge section here, coming out back, oh, this isn't perfect, but you get the idea. All right, so, so there's my tensile specimen, and we're going to load it like so. And if I look, let's say I look in this region here, well, what happens here? Well, Hooke's Law applies, okay? Right? Remember, Hooke's Law just says that the stress is proportional to the strain via a, a set of constants, right? Oops, that's terrible. Right? That's all that Hooke's Law says. But what about at this region here? How about in this region? That's where you, we're going to have yielding occurs. And I'm going to actually ignore the geometric nonlinearity problem I just told you about. Uh, because uh, that really is only going to be the case once necking happens. But if we just have the onset of yielding, so yielding occurs. And what does that mean? What does yielding occurring mean? So let me remind you of just a stress-strain curve here. So here's the strain, here's the stress, and the behavior is linear up to some point, the yield stress, and then it becomes nonlinear. Okay, so we call that the yield stress, right? And let's suppose that this locate this this um, at this location we're at, at this point here, right? So th this is this is where we're at right now. Okay. So that's what's happening in the material. 
This no longer applies. Hooke's law doesn't apply, right? Because we're at this region uh, now. So to see what the problem is, let me remind you of what our calculation of the K matrix looks like. So I'll just say recall. Uh, I'll, I'll just pick an example term, so a representative term uh, in the calculation of the stiffness matrix. Okay, so the first term that we actually showed was that one of the terms looks like the integral over the volume of C11, right? That's the first component of the, the stiffness matrix here. C11 times, and then we had these vector terms, n, comma, 1, n, comma, 1, transpose, right? That was, a, that was a term that we had in the calculation. So, but C11 in this whole thing, we assumed this is a linear elastic material, Right, so what that meant was that uh, C11 was a constant. Okay, it's obvious that when I'm when I'm now at this region of the curve, this this is no longer a constant. This varies, right? So uh, if the material doesn't follow Hooke's law, then that that this term here is going to depend on the displacement. Okay. And I'm being a little sloppy here, right? Because we're not going to use C11 anymore if yielding occurs. We're going to have to adopt a different theory. But the bottom line is that whatever that value needs to be is going to change depending on what the uh, deformation is. As long as we're in the elastic regime, the linear elastic regime, it, it, that term is constant. But once that term becomes non-constant, then that means that our K matrix that we're calculating is going to depend on the displacement. Okay? So again, just like we had above, so this, this leads to the following. Again, we have that now K is going to be dependent on U, the displacement of the nodes, right? So we know how far each thing, everything is stretched. Okay? And we call this type of nonlinearity, we call it material nonlinearity. Okay, so I've talked about three kinds of nonlinearity. Uh, boundary condition nonlinearity, which is uh, typified by contact. Um, we've talked about geometric nonlinearity, uh, demonstrated by this fishing rod, and now I've just showed you material nonlinearity. Uh, I would also say that uh, uh, maybe a subset of material nonlinearity is, is damage um, because it's uh, effectively changing the constitutive behavior in a nonlinear fashion. So um, all, while I showed you yielding, and, and we could t even talk about nonlinear elastic materials, uh, we could also talk about damage, and all would be grouped under the category of material nonlinearity. The other thing that I should bring up about uh, all of these is that there's no there's no requirement that you have only one. Um, oftentimes, you'll have problems that have all three types of nonlinearity, and these really become a, a bear to solve even for commercial codes. So. Um, uh, so again, mostly I'm just making you aware of where the nonlinearity in the problem arises, and, we, and then we'll move to talk about how to handle it. Okay, so, so what have we done so far in this class? So, so far, uh, we've, we've looked at the following. We've looked at the equation that had the form KU uh, is equal to F. Right, and we've... And in, in the, what we've looked at thus far, how we would apply the boundary conditions here would be independent uh, of U, and so would be, and so would K. Okay, so in, in what we have done thus far, both K and and how we apply the boundary conditions here on F, both of those cases would be independent of U. Okay, so the question that we want to pose is how do we solve this set of equations? Where uh, k and and or u and or f rather depend on u, right? So what I'm saying is that what if we have now k, which is a function of u, times uh, u uh, is equal to f, which also could be a function of u. Okay, so we we can't simply uh, solve this system of equations, right? Because we don't know u. That's what we're trying to find. Uh, well, so we can't simply solve for u uh, via our conventional matrix inversion methods. Okay, we need to we need to talk about different methods. So, what we're going to do in this section, the first thing I'm going to do is is we're going to go back to just 
f forget that that's his FEA. We're just going to talk about, suppose we have a 1D nonlinear equation. What are the methods that we can use to solve that equation? Then I'm going to move to talk about specifically a 1D FEA and how we can, um, the, the types of uh, meshes and the types of approaches that we're going to use to, to solve that problem. Uh, and then once it's all tied up for the, the 1D case, which will which will take a few weeks, uh, then we'll move to the 3D case. So, so what we're going to talk about uh, after this is the the general case of a of a uh, just a scalar function that's nonlinear. How do we go about solving that? So hopefully it's something that um, uh, you've seen in maybe a previous numerical methods class. But we'll we'll talk through that just so that uh, you can feel comfortable with it.